with Joe Carducci from Gretsch. He's a glorious individual. I've known Joe since, actually, we were in a parallel universe together <laughs> many, many eons ago. And now we're getting together again. There's no coincidences in this life, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, you know, at lunch, we were just telling a bunch of stories about uh, the fascinating history of uh, music in general, your time in the music industry. But let's talk a little bit about the history of Gretsch. I've got to know Fred Gretsch. He's a great dude. And uh, just a marvelous <coughs> history of a, you know, classic example of people coming over from Europe, old world craftsmanship, hiring a bunch of uh, fellow immigrants to this great nation and putting together a, a, a legendary guitar company that maintains this very day. Yeah, that's basically how it started. A uh, 25-year-old German immigrant, Friedrich Gretsch, <clears throat> from Mannheim, Germany, uh, moved to America with his family to find a better life and uh, started this company in Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> and uh, uh, things took off real well. He was hiring a lot of immigrants in that area uh, that lived in Brooklyn to work at the factory. And really their journey began with uh, you know pop popular musical instruments of the day. So now we're talking late 1800s, early 1900s. <clears throat> Rock and roll hadn't started yet. And really the, uh, the guitar part of the story didn't start until the late 20s, early 30s. <clears throat> but the, uh, even to this day, when you talk to Fred and Dinah Gretsch, it's really, Gretsch is all about family. It really is. And their story uh, certainly tells that, that story where this young man with his family comes to America to start this company. <clears throat> and after 12 years, you know, the company was growing. They were still in Brooklyn, New York. He made his first trip back to Monheim by himself. Now, they didn't have airplanes then. So early, early 1900s, so he had to take the big steamship back. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, uh, medicine back then wasn't like it is today either. On that boat trip back to Monheim, Germany, he got cholera. Oh. And uh, uh, shortly after arriving, he passed away. Oh. A telegram was sent to his wife, Rosa. And, uh, you know, she was at a certainly in an uh, awkward situation to, you know, they were now employing all these people that were working at the factory. And, you know, in the old days, man, mom stayed home and took care of the kids. And uh, what she ended up doing was rather than closing the business down, <clears throat> she ended up turning the company over to their oldest son. He was 15 years old. Oh, good Lord. And he ran that company for 49 years. His name was Fred. <clears throat> and Fred had three sons. And each one of those uh, three sons ran the company at some point in time. And then William or Bill Gretsch, which was one of the three brothers, had a son, which is Fred Gretsch, Got who it. owns the company now. And it's always, you know, even to this day when I do guitar shows and I'm out in the public, I always run into people that go, oh, yeah, I heard Fender bought Gretsch. It's like, no, that's the furthest thing from the truth. <clears throat> As the story unfolded this, uh, of Gretsch, uh, uh, it was no secret when after the Beatles hit in 1964, big corporations were looking at uh, rock and roll and going, man, there's money to be made in this. So big companies moved in and, and bought, uh, I mean, you know, in 1965, it's no secret, uh, Fender was bought out by CBS. Right. That same year, <clears throat> uh, the Gibson Company was bought out by Norland. In 1967, uh, the Gretsch Company was bought out by the Baldwin Company. And of course, at that time, you know, Baldwin was a piano and organ company. Right. And um, <clears throat> as music was changing and things were happening, certainly the Beatles, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, not only the Beatles, but of course, Chet Atkins. Right. And, uh, and of, uh, then, of course, again, in 64, when the Beatles happened, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, the whole MI industry just exploded. And certainly I could speak from my neighborhood. You know, I was one of those little kids that got affected by seeing the Beatles and wanted a guitar. And uh, so did a lot of other kids in the United States, in fact, all over the world because of the Beatles. And uh, as music was changing, uh, the, uh, uh, the Gretsch guitar was kind of falling out of fashion, if you will. And uh, at that time, I know Baldwin was kind of chasing other things, trying to be like whatever was the popular instrument of the day. Right. And really kind of lost sight of who they were. And uh, by the late, let's see, by the late 70s, uh, uh, Baldwin pretty much abandoned the Gretsch company. And to try to get some of their money back, they basically sold all the tools and dies to make the guitars for scrap metal to try to get their money back. And um, 
it wasn't until uh, uh, 19, let's see, 90, uh, 1985 when Fred Gretsch bought the company back from Baldwin. And um, things went very well for, for Mr. Gretsch. Uh, at that time, uh, as I said, you know, when he got, bought the company, basically all he got was uh, uh, the, the patents, uh, the name, the brand name, and uh, some leftover product that were produced during the Baldwin era. And uh, he found this factory, and by gosh, by the mid 80s, some of the finest guitars in the world were coming out of Japan. Right. And uh, he had found this factory in Nagoya, Japan, that made the style of instruments. It's old school guitar building. There's no computers in there that, uh, you know, you could put a block of wood and somebody hits enter on a, right. you know, 90% of it's done in, you know, a matter of seconds. There's a top and there's a there's sides and there's backs and they've got to be glued together. They're very, very labor intensive. In fact, that factory that Fred Gretsch uh, found and had been, uh, you know, kind of gave them the keys, if you will, to uh, the designs, uh, you know, he helped perfect it and, uh, and things did real well. And uh, the missing piece to his business, though, is he didn't have global uh, distribution. That's where FMIC came in. Got it. Is that, uh, you know, um, the, the Fender Company has distribution all over the world. <clears throat> and uh, as the story goes, he approached the, the FMIC folks, uh, I believe it was in 2002, uh, to distribute the, the products for him. And uh, it was at that time, once they sealed that deal, um, the uh, the headquarters for Gretsch Guitars moved over to FMIC, and at that time it was uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Lewis. And the lore of Gretsch Guitars, he was certainly the guy that really set the course, that really perfected the instruments as we know them today. And really, what he did was went back to the recipe, if you will, of the way that Gretsches were being produced at that Brooklyn factory. There was something very magical about them. Yes, and uh, in and with the help of a local cancer clinic that they were able to bring some uh, Gretsch guitars in to do CAT scans so that they could figure out the DNA. How are uh. they put together without sawing vintage guitars in half to be able to analyze them to see how thick they were, what are they made of, the purfling around the insides of the body, what holds them all together. And he really cracked that code. And uh, and that's the way that we make them to this day. We, we in Embrace the the uh, the recipe again, if you will, of the way that they were made in Brooklyn, New York. Awesome. And it's a it's a wonderful instrument, and it's again, it's a we didn't copy anybody. Our designs are unique and very Gretsch, and uh, and they've been embraced. Certainly, you know, they were at the beginning of rock and roll. They were right there with uh, you know first generation rock and roll. I want to say Bo Diddley, yep. Dwayne Eddy. Yep. You can't you can't you know, Eddie, Cochran. Deny Eddie Cochran. Holy yep. smokes, <clears throat> what a talent! That guy was, wow, he was handsome, he was a great guitar player, and he wrote all his own songs, yes. and it was really a shame that he died at such a, at a young age. But uh, uh, that's kind of a quick synopsis of uh, where, the, where, we, where we've been, mm -hmm. and certainly where we're going now with the Gretsch brand is <clears throat> we've certainly embraced, again, as I keep emphasizing about the way that they were produced in Brooklyn, New York, and we appreciate that and we honor it, but guitar playing has changed yes, over the years. Indeed. And moving forward and still maintaining the integrity and the look of Gretsch guitars, it was important to us to keep that stylization. But now we've incorporated other elements into the guitar, again, to make them more play, player friendly. They're, they're being used in lots of other different types of music besides, you know, certainly we have a home in rockabilly and in country music, but they're being used now in punk rock bands sure. and in hard rock bands, hung, swung <laughs> down low through big amplifiers at extreme volumes. And, uh, and it, again, it's a style and a unique look all its own. Absolutely. And, uh, and I don't know, how about you, Greg? What was your first experience of seeing a Gretsch guitar? Well, you know, back in the day, um, I guess the first time because you know, I didn't grow up listening to country music, you know, I was a I was a blues rocker, <laughs> and um, but you know MTV came out, and uh, Brian Setzer was the first time I really, uh, you know, I was in high school when uh, Stray Cats hit it, and and I dug them from the get, and awesome. I remember specifically they were playing on the Grammys, and they did uh, Rock This Town, and I heard that. Uh, 
heard that 6120. I was like, <laughs> damn, that thing sounds good. Uh, and then, of course, in my in my quests for you know learning more about the roots of music and getting into other things, as I started getting uh, a little bit farther along on the guitar. Of course, I became immersed in Chet Atkins, and and I was always very much attracted to that that pristine, glassy tone, but it still had meat. Sure. And um, just remember on so many different records going, oh my God, that tone. And then still being a fan of Brian, Brian Setzer, you know, uh, there was his version of Sleepwalk where he's playing that. It Beautiful. just was glorious, glorious, clean tones. And they have a nice bark when you, when you, when you get involved with the uh, distortion as well. But I guess my other big um, exposure would be with the White Falcons of, you know, being a Neil Young fan. Sure. Uh, as a kid and seeing, you know, always wondering, what is that huge guitar he's playing, that big white beast? And that was probably the first time I ever laid eyes on a Gretsch. But, you know, in my neighborhood, no one had guitars. I mean, I think it's the seven kids. No one else plays. No one else really played in the neighborhood. The guy across the street did. But, uh, you know, he had, a, he had an acoustic guitar, and that was about it. So um, it was very much kind of a self-discovery, an autodidact, if you will, <laughs> situation. And uh, But, you know, I will say, to your point about... The fact that, you know, the old Gretches have that, that, that great tone, but like Brian Setzer, you know, he was bending strings and doing all this different stuff and had to do things to those guitars. He did. To make them a little bit more conducive to, uh, to modern styling. So now that you guys have really dialed in, you know, what the recipe was on the old guitars and then adding in these ergonomic new things, it's just, it's a whole new world. And I think, as, uh, to your point also about the, uh, you know, a lot of young people, I mean, it's the, the, the Kind of the, it's so weird now, because I'm sure you're the same way. When you were growing up, your parents hated the music <laughs> yeah, you listened to. Sure. My dad was like, what is that racket? <laughs> I mean, he grew to appreciate some of the stuff later on. But sure. initially, it was so shocking. Whereas most people that are guitar players that are younger, it's like their dad played and got him into it. And they're kind of, there's a lot of similar area of the stuff that they're into. But by the same token, they want to leave their own mark. And they don't want to play what their dad played. Sure. And so now with these kind of these kind of guitars where they weren't as, you know, uh, they weren't in every ba every band's hands at Woodstock. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. So there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for discovery, but with this lineage behind it, that would be very, very cool. So I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for youngsters to make their own stamp. I mean, just what we've been doing in some of these videos, just you can play screaming blues rock guitar on these guitars and they sound fantastic. And with the bridge pin now, you don't have to worry about making the bridge, you know, fly or hit somebody in the front row or something. Yeah. When you go, Rah! So <laughs> very, very cool. Very, very cool. I like to say that if, uh, if I may, uh, if, uh, if Fender was Chevy, and if Gibson is a Ford, if we're going to relate to cars, owning a Gretsch is kind of owning like a Maserati. Yeah. It's something exotic, and it's very, you don't see them all over the place. Right. And it's kind of like the underdog that's really coming on strong right now in all different kinds of styles of music. And uh, globally, it's just really taken off, and we're really happy campers at our corporate headquarters, believe me. I like it. <laughs> Couldn't happen to a nicer fella, Joe. Doggone it. Well, thanks so much for spinning those yarns with us. What an awesome series of stories. We've had a lot of fun today. We've had some crazy times. We've had some lively times here in the Wildwood <laughs> Lair. I'm here with Joe Carducci from uh, Gretsch, Gregory Cockery here. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Thanks.